she began to break and all the oil had come out, oil was coming out and uh, everybody looked like little rats in the water covered with that, that crude oil. I, along with others, went down hand over hand on a rope. I told the other blacks that were standing there with me, if I said, at least we're going to die if we stay on board ship, let's go for it. You know, he said, well, this, this is Iceland. You don't know what they're going to do. Say, so remember, we just left Iceland and, and no blacks are allowed. Oh, what? Say, it's just like being in Georgia or Mississippi. You mean that you're... I'm sorry, just trying to absorb this. Like yes. You're, you're in a life and death situation. Yes. On the deck of a, getting practically washed off the That's deck right. of a destroyer, which is breaking up. Yeah. And there's four or five black guys having a discussion about yes. whether they should actually swim for it or not. Or not. Be, because they might not be allowed in the land. Right. They want to stay on board ship rather than take a chance of landing in Iceland. I said, well, you know, we're going to die. I say, if we stay on board this ship, I say, at least we can die fighting. I said, let's go. When I jumped in there, it was like I felt just one quick pain, like that went over my entire body, and it was all over. I didn't feel any pain after that. I just felt sleepy. And when we got ashore, I said, well, I made it here, I might as well die, you know. So I just laid down there on the beach and I closed my eyes to die, you know. This is the end. And uh, this fellow came and he, 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 he said, get him up, don't let him lie there. I said, pick him up. I said, he'll surely die if he, he lays there. I said, walk him around. So he pulled me up. And he had on a cap and coat. I knew he wasn't Navy. And uh, he began to walk me around. And uh, from there, it brought life to me. I said, man, here's a white person who wants me to live. And, you know, if I had been in Georgia, it'd say, kick him out of the way, you know. Let's help these white people. Then, uh, I think I passed out. They took them to the, um, where there was a temporary first aid station erected. And of course, the call came to the women. All the women is a place to go out to clean them. And that's where the story came in at Lynn Eyre. Now, the little funny story. See, he was there among all the other survivors. The ladies were cleaning them up and scrubbing them up. Because they were covered with tar, with this old stuff, this crude oil. They were so filthy. They had to be, every part of them had to be washed. So when he opened his eyes... I could see these white ladies all around. There I was, stock naked, on this table. And I heard a, a, one of the ladies say, this is the curliest hair I've ever seen. I said, oh, boy, this is the end of me, you know. I said, hell, they're going to say, get him out of here. He's black, you know. And then she said, This poor fellow, the tar went right into his pores. I'm scrubbing and scrubbing, and I can't get him clean. You know, and I spoke up. She said, can't get it. I said, well, you can't get it off. It's the color of the skin. And she said, oh, I'll get it off all right. And so she continued to scrub. <laughs> Violet fight, but she's dead now. She had never seen a black man before. So, I mean, she didn't differentiate. She just thought he was a white man with, with the black into his pores so bad she couldn't, she couldn't get it out. And I was thinking, oh, boy, are they going to lynch me? Here I am. If I had been in Georgia, they would have ran those white women out of town and maybe lynched me for letting them bathe me, you know? And, of course, when the men were taking him out to the different homes, she said, bring him to my home. So that evening, then, she prepared supper. I mean, he was amazed that he ate with the family, and he, he drank out of china cups, the same as the, as the family. 
and they put me in the bed, and this lady, she would come in and say, are you warm, are you all right? And she did this the remain of the night. I didn't go to sleep anymore because I was still afraid. I didn't know where I was or what was going to happen to me, but then I kept asking myself, did, did, did I die? And, you know, and I went to heaven. Uh, what's going on? Now look at these pictures, huh? After all these years. Now I'll show you, show you. Len Air at that time there, is a 18 years old. See? The next morning, they gave me a coat and a cap, and I put these things on, and I wanted to get outside to see what was going on, and I went outside, and uh, Ina was out there taking pictures. And I seen him, and I said, come on over and get him the picture. Well, I stood aside, but, uh, you know, black is only way he'd take a, a picture with a, a white is because how many logs he could lift, you know, for the sawmill, uh, how many pounds of cotton he could pick in a day uh, or something like that. He was a white man's prize, Negro, you know, or something like that. And she said, get in, get in here and, you know, get your picture taken. Mm -hmm. That's him right wow. there. Yeah, these are the ones I took with the brownie. Four white faces and one black one. Mm -hmm. This story I'd heard as a joke about the Newfoundlanders who tried to scrub the black off a black man, this is like a picture of the joke. But it turns out the real story doesn't stop here. Well, it hasn't been a day pass since that happened. It hasn't been a day pass I didn't think about St. Lawrence. They, they, they changed my entire philosophy of life. So they gave me leave. I think I got 15 days leave. And I went to see my aunt who lived in Chattanooga. And we would catch the bus from there to go into town. And the blacks had to sit behind the whites. And what the whites would do, if it was only three whites on the bus, maybe two of them would go to the seat just before the last seat which means that on the way in, if the bus fill up, the whites would have plenty of seats, and the blacks would only have that one seat. So when we got on, my aunt and I, the back seat was filled, and here was this white guy, so we sat in the seat in front of him. He reached and grabbed me by the neck and pushed me up and said, nigga, don't you sit in front of me. And my, I was going to fight him. I felt like fighting him then because of the treatment I got in St. Lawrence and what the people have treated me like a human being. I said, well, hell, I'm a human. I'm no longer a, a, a slave in the lowest and the least, the last. I said, I'm going to do it. I said, if I can give my life and fight this war the same as everybody else and can't even ride a bus when I pay the same fare as everybody else, but I can't be seated as everyone else. My mother and my aunt said, just be quiet, just be quiet. So we'll be in a few minutes. So I thought about that. Two years after the shipwreck. They sent me to uh, Jacksonville, Florida. And when I got to Jacksonville, I was hungry. And when I got off and walked into the station, I saw all these prisoners, Italian and German prisoners, and they had army MPs, Americans, got them. They had them inside the dining room eating. And I knew that the blacks could go to a window or something somewhere, but I knew they were, wouldn't be allowed to go into that dining room. And I thought about the people of St. Lawrence, how they had fed me gave me clothing and put me in their bed. And I looked at the prisoners, and here I am in American uniform. So I went in to ask, you know, where does the colored, is what they call us then, where can the colored uh, Negroes, you know, get...